she quit in one day. She just walked out. She was so upset that she got in the limo and threw her car keys to the guard at the gate and says, tell Mr. Zanuck he knows what he can do with these. Whatever happened made her really mad. She left Fox and never went back. Alice Faith fired Fox. They didn't fire her. A film aficionado will think a person's career is over when they stop making movies. In point of fact, Alice became probably more popular in the United States after she left Fox than when she was at Fox. She did have a dream as a child. She knew she was going to be something special. Her voice was a unique, uh, smooth, velvety voice. She had hit the tops. She had been the number one box office draw in 1940. She had been the queen of the 20th Century Fox lot. As the dream wore on, she had another dream. And maybe that dream was to be a wife and a mother and have a normal life. She says, I don't need stardom anymore. I just don't need it anymore. I think that Alice certainly had found herself and gained a new confidence in her marriage to Phil that she did not have prior to it. Having the baby was real life, and the other was play acting. She wanted a real life. She wanted to, you know, spend time with Alice and I and do things that normal people did. Her family and her marriage became her top priority, whereas her career had been that top priority a few years previously. She didn't even know how to drive a car. She'd never gone to the grocery store. She had never done anything for herself. The studio took care of everything for her. She came in and told Alice and I that we were going to be a real family. We were going to have a small house, and she was going to cook, and we would make cookies, and that it was going to be just like a real family. She really wanted to be a housewife. And uh, one of her best friends said to her, oh, for heaven's sakes, don't you know how to hire a maid? You know. And mom said, no, I like doing this. A lot of stars loved their career. Betty Davis told Alice in later years, if I didn't have my career, I might as well be dead. And Alice says, I'm sure glad I don't feel that way. She would have been in violation of her contract had she decided to pursue acting in films uh, with anyone else. It did not preclude the option of performing on radio, and that's in fact what she did. She returned to radio where she started out. Every Sunday evening, she and Phil Harris, from 1946 on to 1954, had a weekly Sunday night radio program. Yes, it's Sunday. Time for the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show. The radio, they didn't have all, you know, you didn't have to have your makeup just right or your hair just right or the right outfit. Radio was a medium in which Alice was very comfortable. It was one of the best radio programs on the air, and it was a kind of spin-off of the Jack Benny Show, which preceded it immediately on the network. Because on that program, Phil Harris was indeed the band leader for the Jack Benny program. I've been with Jack Benny for 16 years, and ain't no money connected with that guy. <laughs> and they created a persona for him that was irresistible. Now, I don't know where people get such wild ideas about Phil. Well, after all, he is quite a character on the Jack Benny program. Yes, but really, George, he's not that way at all when you get to know him. Uh... Yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> Dad was kind of a, a drinking, carousing person, always getting in some kind of a jam. Well, if it isn't Phil, don't put an olive in. It soaks up the good stuff, Harry. I think that Mr. Benny pegged him pretty well when he got his character. He was like that anyway, but that just brought out probably the, the worst in him or the best. Well, he was such a ham. Mother was mother with a beautiful voice and, you know, the nice lady. Daddy's character, he was a nut, and Mother was trying to hold things together. I think he's wonderful. Oh, you're just saying that because you're stuck with him. <laughs> <laughs> That's beside the point. Where Ozzie and Harriet were the perfect American family, Alice and Phil were out there and totally dysfunctional. Nothing was working right, other than they liked each other. I mean, it was a happy family, but... Something was always wrong. I mean, it was craziness. One of the running gags on the Phil Harris, Alice Faye show was that they were more or less playing themselves. I mean, they were Phil Harris and Alice Faye on the program. Harmonious discord. And that's the way they lived their lives at home. I mean, they were the Bickersons. If mother said it was white, he said it was green. 
And if she said it was hot, he said it was cold. And that's kind of the way the radio show went. They just bickered all the time. Radio was amazing, just to stand there with scripts and and do a show after, after just reading it a couple of times. There were constant allusions to her being a former movie star. We've been sending Miss Faye scripts. She likes them, but she just won't do a picture. Now, why? It's not her fault, Daryl. It's that husband of hers. You know, um, <laughs> that guy she uses as a stooge on a radio program. There was always a running gag about the fact that Daryl Levzanik was on the phone and, you know, wanted her to come back. And, of course, it probably was true. She was still a beloved star. And if she had gone back, I'm sure Zanuck would have embraced her in a minute. The beginning of each Alice Faye Phil Harris radio show was preceded by an announcement that Miss Faye appears courtesy of 20th Century Fox. And I don't know if that was something that their legal department worked out, but there was always a reminder at the beginning of every show that she was still under contract to 20th Century Fox. When everybody else went to television, I do know that my dad didn't want to. Phil realized it would be extremely hard work compared to radio. In the years following the end of the radio show, she is a woman of leisure for the first time in her life. It was a very quiet, productive period. And mother had a sign on the door that said, leave your shoes and your friends outside. <laughs> and she meant it. <laughs> After the end of the Phil Harris, Alice Faye radio show, Phil really became the celebrity of the family. And I think Alice was quite content to let him do that. Daddy did American Sportsman with Bing Crosby a lot. I came to know Phil Harris when I was at ABC Sports, uh, primarily at the Bing Crosby Clam Bake, which is now the AT&T Pebble Beach Golf Tournament. One of the years we did the Crosby, we got totally rained out. And uh, what we had to do was fill the network airwaves for 30 minutes. And what we did is we put together a celebrity show. And it was raining. And Phil helped us, along with Bing, put together the celebrity show that was just a who's who of Hollywood. And I remember after going off the air, we all went into the pub at Pebble Beach, and Phil just held court. And it was really a lot of fun and a lot of laughs. Phil Harris appeared to me to be bigger than life. Alice Faye wasn't interested in going back into movies and resisted going back for a long time. In 1962, they uh, were planning an ill-advised remake of State Fair. And she got a call from Charles Brackett, uh, who was a producer at 20th Century Fox at the time, and somehow uh, convinced her to come back. In fact, it was Phil who talked her into accepting the offer to do State Fair in 1962. Daddy was traveling a lot, doing American sportsmen and things like that that he enjoyed and maybe she just thought that she would get a little active again. It's the remake of State Fair that co-starred Pat Boone and Margaret and Alice had been promised by the studio that they would get Don Amici as her husband in the movie. Unfortunately because of other commitments he was unable to do that and they got Tom Yule instead. And I believe that was one of the first disappointments in an experience that she considered pretty disappointing overall. But when she went back to do State Fair, um, nothing was the same. Alice's appearance in State Fair delighted a lot of her fans. And I think it introduced her to the uh, younger crowd, the people who were the Pat Boone fans or the Anne Margaret fans. I don't think she had any idea who the young people were that she was working with. She had no idea who they were. Pat Boone has always been a good friend. He's a lovely guy. She wanted to see what Hollywood was all about and how it had changed or stayed the same in the preceding 17 years. And at the end of the experience, she said she was very sorry that she had. I think that Alice's work with Pfizer is possibly the most interesting aspect of her character. They wanted somebody that would travel and speak to senior citizens about staying fit, and she surely fit that. She was very fit and, and beautiful looking in her older age. Alice Faye was chosen purely by accident. Uh, there were a group of executives got together and wanted to uh, have a spokesperson represent senior fitness and good health. 
and they wanted a celebrity spokesperson to do that to attract attention to get some publicity. And when they thought about who was uh, recognizable, who was noticeable, um, and who didn't have some baggage, some reputation that, that might detract from the message that we wanted to project, it was a very short list that, that existed. And one of the executives mentioned the name Alice Fay. And funnily enough, everyone around the table said, oh, I remember her from the King Kong movie. And he shook his head. He said, no, Alice Fay, not Fay Ray. And I, I know Alice dealt with that uh, a lot during, uh, during the tour with us and during the, her career. She was more outgoing, let's just say that. I think Pfizer did that for her. She, she kind of got out of the house. Alice was a little nervous. Alice was not comfortable in front of a large, uh, large crowd. We realized that we had something special because the crowd just responded to her. Working for Pfizer was uh, uh, terrific for my mother because it proved that she could do something else besides movies and radio. Alice's tenure with Pfizer lasted from 1984 through 1992. It was fun to, to be out on the road with Alice Fay, going from city to city. Uh, the program, I believe, uh, ran its course uh, through those eight years uh, because we took it as far as it, it could go. At that time, Daddy was off doing things and, and um, she kind of came home and had to start over again. Alice's final years with Phil involved travel, involved time with her daughters. Phil was 11 years older than Alice, so his health began to decline a little bit sooner than hers did. They had a bizarre, wonderful time, really. It was, like we said earlier, she used to throw him out in the morning, and honestly, he was 87 years old, 88 years old, and he'd be driving down the highway like Mr. Magoo, going to his office, and she never gave it a thought. I mean, she'd say, why that old war horse, nothing will ever bother him. And at 6 o'clock, here he'd come putt, 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 putting up the driveway. <laughs> After Daddy died, it was like she just got this faraway look in her eye and she just kind of faded away. That's what happened. She just got sick and just went really quickly. I think Alice Faye needs to be remembered as someone who really met the needs of the American public at a critical time in our history. She really seemed like a movie star. She had a charisma of being a movie star, but she didn't really act like one. The mere fact that she came from nothing and achieved what she achieved with really probably an eighth grade education, um, it's amazing. I mean, it's amazing what she did. I think that probably she made a lot of people really happy. I mean, I still get letters all the time from people. It's been years since her film career was at its peak, and people still remember her and love her. I think during the war, when her movies were really big, that she gave a lot of soldiers a lot of happiness. And I think probably that, and the fact that she was a good wife to my dad and a good mom to Alice and I. And who 